the Christ experience can come in three ways. It can come, and it has to some people, as the grace of God, as a gift of God, for no seeming human reason. It has come to some without them knowing why, without them having any reason for it, without their deserving it or being worthy of it, just out of the blue. Well, in those cases, the fact is that they were prepared for it in previous experience. Their consciousness had been prepared for it, and uh, they have undoubtedly come back into this human experience for the very purpose of uh, achieving or attaining their Christhood. Perhaps for the purpose of performing some specific work. Always remember that these gifts of God are never given to an individual as a reward for anything or for his pleasure or her pleasure or profit. When a gift of God is given to anyone, it is for God's purpose on earth. It is never meant to glorify an individual. It is never meant to set any individual up on high. That is why Jesus Christ refused honors during his lifetime. Why callest thou me good? There is but one good, the Father in heaven. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. My doctrine is not mine. Always he was disclaiming anything in the way of a personal uh, message or gift or set aside selfhood. Always his work was to glorify him that sent me into expression. So it is, as we follow the lives of all of those who have been ordained of God into the starting of new religious teachings, into the revelation of new religious teachings, we find that their outstanding quality is humility not a false sense of humility that acts like sanctimoniousness, but a real sense of humility which comes from their absolute knowledge that whatever it is that is taking place through them is not of their own doing. It is something that is being compelled. It is an impulsion from an infinite source. And uh, it is not that that individual have a great name. It is not that that individual attain great wealth. It is that that individual in forgetting self carry forth whatever the mission is uh, that goes with it. We had an example of a work of this nature that was destroyed some years ago. There was a man in the Near East who was a very simple man, a, an almost uneducated man, but one of great spiritual gifts, and more especially in healing. And uh, the result was that in his community, where there was so much of disease, so much lack of sanitation, so much ignorance on all subjects, he was enabled to do a great work in healing and in restoring people to health and harmony. But his, na his fame spread beyond the borders of his land and one of his countrymen who was in contact with one who had migrated from there years before 
wrote about the miracle works that this man was doing and it so happened that the one in the States had an epileptic son. And this man in the States having attained millionairedom, nothing would do but that he should bring this holy man across to the United States to heal his son. Would have been very well, it would have been very fine if he had just done it secretly and sacredly. But no, he had to let the press know about it so that when this man arrived in New York, you'd have thought it was President Eisenhower arriving, the crowds that were there all seeking to be healed. And all the way across to California, this man was given no sleep and no rest and no peace. He was hounded from pillar to post with everybody that had a sore limb, wanting it to be healed or straightened until he reached California and failed in his work. That is, he failed in the healing of that one man. He healed hundreds of others. But all the other hundreds that he healed did not make up for the one failure. And so he was, uh, his uh, permit was taken up and he was sent back to his home virtually in disgrace because of his failure. You see, the spiritual has no part in public demonstrations. The spiritual has no part in what we might call miracles, working miracles for miracles' sake, just healing the sick because they're sick. That is not the part of the spiritual. That is why the Master would ask, Do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that I can do it? In other words, he wasn't set into the Holy Land just to walk up and down and heal everybody who was sick. No, he came to those of his own household, those who were ready to receive uh, the spiritual impulse, those who were ready to learn about God and to do the will of the God. That is why the Master gave us the Sermon on the Mount instead of the Ten Commandments. He was not going to leave these Hebrew people just Hebrews living their ordinary life, not even if they were living good lives. He said very clearly to them, Your righteousness must be greater than that of the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And do you know that the scribes and the Pharisees were the most righteous Hebrews on earth? They were of all the most righteous, but your righteousness must exceed theirs. Did you know that he said of John the Baptist, yes, he's the holiest man in all Israel, but the least spiritual among you will get into heaven before John the Baptist with all his goodness, with all his virtue, with all his righteousness. Why? Because there is a something that transcends human goodness. There is something that transcends human virtues. And that is when you come to the place and say, I am not good. Any good that's being manifested through me is the Father. There's no evil in me because all evil is the one universal belief in two powers. But neither is there good in me of my own. For there is only one good, the Father. And whatever good shines through me is the Father shining through for I have no goodness of my own. <coughs> this is the righteousness <coughs> that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and this is the righteousness that John the Baptist didn't have. He lived up to the law. He lived up to the rules of the synagogue. But he didn't have love. Because he would have stoned the woman taken in adultery. He would have obeyed the laws and thrown the lepers outside the gate. He would have obeyed the law and stayed in the temple all day on the Sabbath 
regardless of how much good he might have been able to do outside. But the master was willing to violate the rules of the synagogue. He was willing to do on the Sabbath day what was forbidden to do on the Sabbath day. He was willing to reveal truth that he was forbidden to reveal, the name and the nature of God. He was willing even to preach that you have no right to go to that synagogue and pray. You should pray in spirit and in truth. He was even willing to reveal that your sacrifices to the temple are worthless, that God has no pleasure in your sacrifice, and the temple's merely taking away your money and giving you nothing in return. He was willing to do all that for a higher righteousness which is to reveal to men the source of good, the source of harmony, the source of health, the source of virtue. So it is, then, that if you would have the Christ experience, you will have to rise higher than obedience to the law. You have to rise higher than that. You will have to be able to read your newspaper and read about these criminals and instead of uh, being willing that they be executed, instead of saying, serves you right, you had it coming to you, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you will have to rise in consciousness to where you can say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That doesn't mean turn them loose on the streets to commit crimes. But if you must incarcerate them, don't do it for punishment. Do it for instruction. Certainly, the criminals who continue in their crimes must be kept separate from society, but not executed and not punished, taught, spiritually taught, until those that are enabled to receive and respond can be turned loose in society to begin over again and those who can't will just stay there for the remainder of their days on earth. This idea of believing there's one crime that deserves 20 years and one deserves 30 years is nonsense. Believe me, if it deserves 20 years, it deserves forever or until the person has been spiritually regenerated. But in our conduct, in our inner attitude toward those who are in error, in any way, shape, manner, or form, there must be a rising in consciousness to the place where we can literally pray, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Because in the Master's teaching there is provision for forgiving 70 times 7, which means eternally, 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 without limit, without end. Also, there is provision in the Master's teaching for praying for your enemies, for praying for those who despitefully use you. As a matter of fact, praying more for them for your, than for your friends, because... The scribes and the Pharisees, he says, pray for their friends. But not ye, my disciples. Ye must pray for your enemies that ye may be children of God. It profiteth you nothing to pray for your friends. Ye must pray for your enemies. And certainly all our enemies are these men in prisons as well as those who are out in this world doing injury to their fellow man, enslaving them mentally or physically. So you see that there is no Christ experience for anyone 
while they are living on the human plane. There must be a purification of consciousness, which is called a baptism of the Spirit, the descent of the Holy Ghost, in which you lose human judgment, criticism, condemnation, in which you are of two pure eyes to behold iniquity. Not that you're not aware that it's going on, but that you are inwardly praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, this is even easier done, or more easily done, than when it comes to your own family and your own friends and your own neighbors. Because you would be surprised how we hold them in condemnation, how we are complaining about their natures or their ingratitude or their lack of love or their lack of cooperation or their opposite. Always we can find some fault with those who are nearest and dearest to us and probably because they are so close to us that their human faults are more obvious. There's no denying that they may have them. But the point is that before you have more righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees, you have got to be able to know that those faults stem from an impersonal source and stop laying the blame on person. Whether that person, I'm telling you, is friend or relative, or whether it's one of your government officials or some other government's officials, you have got to be able to behold all evil as having its origin in an impersonal, universal source so that you separate it from the individual. Until you can do that, you cannot spiritually heal. Because all spiritual healing is based on the premise, the principle, that there is a source of evil, that we are but the victims of it, we are not responsible for it except in our ignorance of its nature and its operation. Just think, in some forms of metaphysical practice, when an individual calls for help, the first thing you try to do is to find out what the error is in them. Uncover it. Remove it. Our work is the opposite. Our work is the direct opposite. We never permit thought to dwell on any person's erroneous traits, character, nature, qualities. We immediately separate them by saying that's the carnal mind or mortal mind or the devil or universal belief. Whatever term we use, we instantly separate the seeming evil, the same as we would the disease. You wouldn't want to blame a person for having a cold or for having tuberculosis or having a cancer. You wouldn't want to blame them for it. They didn't do it intentionally. They didn't do it willfully. Well, no more did they have an evil disposition. No more did they have a miserliness. No more did they have coldness intentionally. Because if you get to know these people, you'll know that they know themselves what they're really lacking of the Christ and how much they want it. And so you will know that the greatest benefit you can ever be is to recognize no matter what trait of character, erroneous trait, negative trait, that you observe in anyone, be as quick to realize its impersonal nature, its impersonal source, as you would if it were an illness. Now just think, 
We've gone in the last few years through quite a few epidemics of flu. And uh, if someone came to you for help with that, you couldn't possibly feel any sense of that they're to blame or they're responsible or that they did this themselves. You would instantly know. You couldn't help knowing that this is part of an epidemic and a part of a universal belief that's going around. And so you would separate it. You would realize instantly this has nothing to do with you. This has to do with that universal belief that's going around. It's a medical belief, really, in two powers. And uh, in doing this, you would start the healing in motion right away. The instant that you would impersonalize, instead of saying, well, our resentment gave you that cold, or irritation gave you that uh, irritated skin, instead of those superstitious, and that's all they are, superstitions, instead of that, realize evil has no cause because God is the only cause. God is the only creative principle. Therefore, disease cannot have a cause. It cannot have a creative principle. It cannot have a spiritual source or ordination. Ah, yes, but we have said that spirit is all. Well, if spirit is all, then it has no ordination and it has no source, no cause. And in thus impersonalizing it and nothingizing it, that is your healing consciousness. That is your realization of oneness, one power. And in the realization of one power, nothing else has power, and you are beginning to heal right there. Right in the very instant that you can accept omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, in that moment you are beginning to heal. In the moment that you can accept all evil as having its source in the universal belief in two powers, you're beginning to heal. The moment you stop personalizing sin, disease, and poverty, you are eradicating it. The very moment that you know that these do not have their source in God, you are dissolving them. Because they have only existence. They have existence only in the belief that there is a cause for them, a source, a law. You see, if anything has a law, it is indestructible. If H2O is water, then that's indestructible, and nobody can ever change it. H2O must always produce water. If two times two are four, that's indestructible, and nobody can ever change it. There it is, four, and that's the end of it. And there's no exception to prove the rule. Anything that has a law is indestructible and eternal. Therefore, disease can't have a law because even medically it can be cured. So therefore, there is no law of disease. Disease has no foundation except in a universal belief in two powers and that can't be a law and it can't be a power because it isn't truth. There is no truth to two powers. There is no God to two powers. There is no law to two powers. Therefore, one with God is a majority. The moment you know this truth, the truth can make you free. The truth itself can never make anyone free. Ye must know the truth for the truth to make you free. There were laws of automotive engineering. There were laws of aerodynamics. There were laws of telegraphy. Thousands of years ago, laws of radio, laws of television, thousands of years ago. They did nothing for anybody. 
until those laws were known. Ye shall know these laws, and then you can hook them up, then you can have the benefits. And so it is, these laws of spiritual healing have existed throughout all time. But they rose to their highest in the experience of Jesus Christ, who was so deeply illumined, so completely and consciously one with God, that he saw no obstructions, he saw no powers, he felt none, and he could say, what did hinder you? And any appearance or claim of power just dissolved in the presence of his consciousness. And there were mighty healing works by Mrs. Eddy and in Mrs. Eddy's day. Mighty healing works. Let no one ever deny that. The whole world is interested in spiritual healing today and primarily because of what happened through her and her works and her students. And in the beginning, they perceived too that there was only one power. It was lost later. It always is lost afterward. And it's always lost the same way. It is lost through organizing. You see, if the infinite way isn't organized, you are an individual and your demonstration depends on your state of developed consciousness. And you've got a responsibility for yourself, which you can't pass on to me or to a board of directors or to a name called the infinite way. You've got principles that have been revealed to you and you're told honestly and openly that they can only operate in proportion to your grasp of them. And so therefore, for all the rest of your days, you've got nobody to rely on or fall back on but yourself. You know you can have temporary help by turning to a practitioner or teacher, but you know that it's only temporary and you know that it can't keep on forever. Well, you know, if it could, don't you know all the wealthy people would be hiring us and all the rest of you would have no chance? <laughs> but this is something that can't be bought. You can't hire someone to live your life for you. There was a time when practitioners took cases, not cases, but patients, by the year. $20 a month, $30 a month, $40 a month. And uh, the idea was that they woke up every morning and did your protective work. And they worked for your prosperity. And they took care of your business problems. All you had to do was get up and enjoy life. <laughs> well, it didn't work out very well or it would have been internationally widespread by now. And don't ever believe that the wealthy can hire a practitioner to relieve them. They can only do what you can do. Find someone with some degree of illumination that can help out over the rough places or in the beginning before you attain the rightness of your realization. That's why Jesus Christ was here to prove to us that one can do it for multitudes. But he also revealed that if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. In other words, I can't do it forever. He wouldn't feed those people. Only twice he fed them. And the second time, reluctantly, he thought he showed them the principle the first time and that ought to be enough. But he did it the second time, but never a third time. And you see, according to our beliefs, we think he could have set up soup kitchens all over the Holy Land and just multiplied loaves and fishes all day long and nobody again would ever have to work. But why didn't he do that? He didn't have the power to do it. So it is. The truth can't make you free. 
But ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But ye must know it. And above all things, before the spiritual experience can come to you, you must have greater righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees. You must stop indulging the belief that any person on this earth of themselves, in and of themselves, are evil. You must understand that all evil has its foundation in an impersonal belief in two powers. You may call that belief the devil if you like, or you may call it the carnal mind, you may call it mortal mind, or you may call it universal belief or an appearance. But when you are calling it something, realize in the self-same instant that because it isn't ordained of God, it is not power. Then you've completed your treatment. That is then the state of consciousness that can receive the Christ because that is the pure or virgin state of consciousness. It hasn't two powers. It doesn't believe in the pain of the flesh, but neither does it believe in the pleasure of the flesh. It has neither pain nor pleasure. It has only God. It has only spiritual enlightenment and spiritual joy and spiritual health. It doesn't have good health and bad health. It is a completely virgin state of consciousness that has no health, just divine being. And so it is. When you are not a house divided against yourself, when you are not a consciousness divided against yourself, you're pure. The Christ can find entrance. And the Christ has a name. It always comes to you with the word, with the name I. It always comes and says, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will be with thee to the end of the world. I will go before thee and uh, make mansions for you. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. It always speaks to you from the center of your being with that word I. I am closer to you than your breathing, nearer than your hands and feet. I and my Father are one. Son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. I am thy bread, I am thy meat, I am thy wine, I am thy resurrection. But you see, this can only come when you can look out and realize that every man or woman has the same spiritual virgin consciousness that you have, only they are not yet aware of it. They have not yet been instructed in it. In other words, you don't believe for a minute that a person could steal that knows that God is their supply. Why should they? They can't lack. They can't need anything. They've got everything everybody else has and a little more than most. The very moment they realize, here too is purity. Don't ever believe that God sends good or that God gives good. God is the only good. God doesn't send supply. God doesn't send manna from the sky. God doesn't send a raven carrying food. God is these. God is the very manna itself. That is why he said, do not seek what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal. Do not seek forms. Do not seek effects. Do not seek a form of good or an effect of good. 
You're trying to break off a little piece of God. Seek the kingdom of God itself. When you have it, it will appear as manna from the sky. It will appear as ravens bringing food. It will appear as good business. It will appear as wonderful ideas. It will appear as plots for stories. It will appear as any form necessary to your expression. But if you try to seek it, it will be like trying to seek a microphone. After you get it, you'll say, well, now what am I going to do with it? I haven't got the rest of the set. Well, let's have another prayer now for the rest of the set. Well, we get the rest of the set. Oh, but I have no electricity. Well, another prayer now for the electricity. And so we go over and over and over again. We want money, or we want a home, or we want companionship. or we. But after we get it, we haven't got all the other things that make it complete. Whereas, if we have the one thing, the realization of God, all these things are added unto us, all of these other forms appear, and when we have one, we have all the rest. I remember one time when uh, I was engaged in uh, some very distressing thoughts, thinking about the supply that I didn't have and should have, when I was led by the Spirit itself to a book and told right where to open the very page. And when I opened to that page, these were the words that stood out. You will have the consciousness of health to enjoy wealth and the consciousness of wealth to enjoy health. And I was able to relax. Because here it wasn't going to be halfway. The way I was thinking, it would have been all right if I'd have had the supply, but I might have been awfully sick and not be able to enjoy it. But here divine wisdom knew better than I that it takes both health and wealth before you have uh, much of a picture. But what it was trying to say to me, it wasn't really limiting itself just to health and wealth. It was trying to show me that you have to have wholeness, the consciousness of good. When you have the consciousness, you have the health to enjoy the wealth. You have the wealth to enjoy the health and probably somebody to share it with. So it is then that instead of trying to bite off a little piece of God here and there, if we have the consciousness that it's enough to know that if I have the grace of God that's my sufficiency in all things. I don't have to ask for the grace of God to give me food or house or automobile. Just the grace of God alone and this includes all things and that's purity you see. You have to be pure enough not to divide consciousness up into little bits of forms and want those. Keep consciousness intact and desire to live and move and have your being in the God consciousness and let that appear as form. Now, I said there are three ways of attaining this. And the first one is, of course, by divine illumination which comes because we have previously been prepared for it. <clears throat> the second way is through the consciousness of one who is illumined. In other words, the guru system of the East is built on that. We have never known this in the West because we don't know the truth about consciousness. But I, if I be lifted up, can draw others up to my state of consciousness. In other words, a teacher who is illumined can lift his students or her students to their own state 
of illumination. It may be in some cases that the student will go higher than the teacher was. That also depends on their background. But the point is this, that wherever students have the opportunity to be in the consciousness or to be a part of the consciousness of an illumined teacher, be assured that they are being lifted up to some measure of that same attainment. Because there are so few of those teachers in the world, most of the world will have to come to it the third way. And that is, through knowing the truth and practicing the truth. It is necessary to know, first of all, these two principles, as I have just given them to you, impersonalization and nothingization, meaning that the very moment any form of evil touches your consciousness, that you instantaneously realize this is no part of person, this is uh, the universal belief in two powers. Then, uh, that you realize since that belief didn't come from God, it has no ordination, it has no law of God, no life of God, no substance of God, and it is a nothingness that you need not fear. Then, uh, rest in the assurance that God is omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. The other helps toward attaining this virgin mind is learning the true nature of God so that you do not waste time trying to influence God to do something, so that you do not try to beg or plead with God to do something, that you do not believe or accept the belief that God is withholding something. Get to know God as God really is. This actually forms one of the greatest, the largest life patterns in my experience. This coming to know God aright. Coming to know God in a way of not uh, holding a concept of God, not believing in a God that gives or withholds, not believing in a God that punishes or awards, but coming to realize that God is the very soul of this life. God is the very principle of this existence. God is the very intelligence and the love. And God is just as much to me as God is to you. God is just as much to you as God is to me. For God is no respecter of persons. And if any one of us is having more of God's grace than another, it isn't because of God. It's because of our greater knowing the truth. God has never given more to one than to another. God has never given more to one race or religion than to another. For God is not giving anything to anybody. God is just being God. God is the creative principle of this universe. God is the maintaining and sustaining principle of this universe. And... Uh, Everyone who has ever headed, founded, revealed a great religion has revealed these self-same principles of the nature of God. What the students did with them afterward is quite pitiful. I don't have to tell you how extreme students can be in their twisting of a teacher's teaching. I need only tell you that uh, a few months ago in a class, there was a question on the table from a student who said, I have a letter from my friend who heard you in Chicago and heard you say that there is no God. Now, that's how a teaching can be <laughs> twisted upside down. And, and then mistakes can happen too. Uh, I'll tell you one that happened this month in our November letter. Those of you who have copies of it can have a good laugh about it tonight. It says on page 8 that uh, I and the Lord thy God will never leave thee. And then it's signed Joel. 
Now, I can well imagine somebody picking that up sometime and saying, oh, that's who he thinks he is. <laughs> I can even imagine some very sweet, serious student saying, oh, you see, our teacher, he, he's right there on the right side of God. It happened in Jesus' day. It's happened in other days. It will happen again. Uh, teachings never go down in their pure state. And the reason is, unless you accept the responsibility for your own demonstration, you'll be relying on something that I said in a book. And somebody may have done just a good job of misprinting as that or misinterpreting. You yourself have to be responsible for understanding and demonstrating the principle. And then if someone comes along and tells you that Joel said that next Friday we are not going to have sunshine, you can say, I'll take God's word first. Yes, all of this deifying, personalizing, is responsible for the loss of religion. And the organizing that makes us dependent on the religion, such as the Hebrew saying, oh, we are God's chosen people. Or the Roman Catholics who say, we have the only true God. Or the metaphysician who says, nobody but us can have our prayers answered. God only heals through metaphysicians. And sometimes even a particular school of metaphysics. Now, all this personalizing all of this reliance on our group selves is what destroys religious teaching. Because every great revelator has revealed what God is, that God is, the nature of God, the function of God in the midst of you, closer to you than breathing. The kingdom of God is not up there in that holy mountain it is not down in Jerusalem in that holy temple. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. It is within you. And then somebody joins something and goes on a trek to Mecca. Or Mecca by some other name and believes they're doing something holy and pleasing God. The place whereon thou standest is holy ground, and I don't care if thou art in prison, or hell, or sin, or disease. The place whereon thou standest is holy ground, and your knowing this truth will transform the hell into heaven. It will transform the prison into an open door. I have seen that in my prison work, the amount of men who have walked out of prison after they began to know this truth. Oh yes, it is individual responsibility. No one is responsible for your life but you. Again, just as I brought to your attention the fact that everything that has form symbolizes the idea behind it. Or we might say, shows forth something of a real nature. So it is with us. Each one of us is an individual form which symbolizes reality, God. Each one of us is the showing forth of a particular facet of God. One may express it in one way and another in another, but we were all intended to show forth a spiritual facet in a spiritual way. Of course we lost the way and human beings are not showing forth God. They are not showing forth the glory of God and you can see that when you see what they've done with their lives, when you see what they've done with their bodies. You can see that they're not showing forth God's glory. But once they are back on the spiritual path, 
once they begin to obey the master if you abide in this word let this truth abide in you you will bear fruit richly you will begin to show forth God's glory not your own God's glory and it will be infinite it will be wonderful last night I spoke of the three stages of our unfoldment the stage in which we turn to God or truth for something for ourselves the stage in which we begin to think of God and truth and some friend or relative and the third stage in which we're beginning to forget ourselves and uh, we are wanting uh, to benefit the world we are wanting to give this pearl that we have found to someone else or to the whole world at large well just as it is with us individually so it is collectively and the world is now at that stage prophesied of old which is the one before the kingdom of God comes on earth we are now entering the age of love thy neighbor as thyself if I were wholly dependent on newspapers and magazines and radio I wouldn't believe this unless it was spiritually revealed to me but it is because I have been these many years traveling the world and more especially the last 14 15 years and still more especially the last eight years in which I've covered the whole world nine times not counting how many times across the continent in which I've actually observed that aside from the Iron Curtain countries the motivating force the animating force in practically every government is that of trying to help some other nation I would like to point out to you first that at the end of World War one England France and the United States guaranteed that there would be a World War two they caused it I will make that statement to you openly they caused it they made it inevitable they took the enemy after they had vanquished them and bound them hand and foot didn't allow them enough food to eat didn't allow them enough clothing didn't allow them enough coal didn't allow them enough iron didn't allow them even to have back their own country and every time that a Republican form of government was formed that would help to change it these three countries broke them down again so that they couldn't operate and we made it necessary for a Hitler to rise we compelled Germany to raise a Hitler to tear Germany loose from the shackles that we had placed on the and were keeping on the we are responsible for World War two and I made a collection of books over a period of night from 1921 to 1939 to prove to the world that it was causing a war and I began that collection in 1921 to prove that these three countries were ensuring that a world war take place and not escape us and be assured it is true not only it is true these three countries now know that it's true and after the second world war they determined it shall not happen again and they went into Germany and they went into Japan and they went into Austria and they began to help them rebuild 
they began to use the policy of forgiveness you didn't know what you were doing and maybe we were partly wrong and now we're going to right these wrongs we're going to help you get back on your feet and from that day to this every major nation on earth is setting aside money to help other nations the United Nations sent into Burma one of America's great teachers to reorganize and build a whole educational system after the communists were thrown out. The communists wrecked their educational system, what little one they had, and the United Nations financed the whole rebuilding of their educational system through this great teacher. This same teacher, after four years in Burma, was sent to Liberia and has done the same job in Liberia that she did in Burma and she has since retired and she brought with it the infinite way because she was a student of the infinite way that's how I know this history now <clears throat> through the United Nations through the contributions that the United States is individually making and England and France now through contributions that other nations are making there isn't a place on this globe where love thy neighbor as thyself is not being demonstrated everywhere it is being demonstrated in national life and these old national animosities are fast disappearing off the globe all of these old animosities and hatreds and greeds and lusts are disappearing from the earth they exist, oh yes, they exist in a few isolated spots where the nature of people is backward, where they are not yet up into the 20th century, where they haven't spiritually evolved. You'll find some very dark spots on the globe, but not many, and not of large enough capacity to undo that which all the rest of the great nations are doing, loving thy neighbor as thyself. They probably would feel a bit bashful if you were to tell them that that's what they're doing, putting a religious principle into practice. They would probably tell you they're just doing it from selfish motives. It isn't true. It isn't true. They are doing it because they have seen what happens when you don't do it. They have seen that you make your own enemies. They've seen that you arouse the antagonisms that are directed against you. And they have seen that you can prevent it. And that's the way the world is going now. And you will see. We have a few problems left. As they are eradicated, you will find that you are living and your children are living in an era of love thy neighbor as thyself and this is the beginning of that virgin consciousness into which the Christ can come because self is out selfishness is out bigotry is out bias is out and what are you left with a virgin consciousness of love into which the Christ can come true at first that consciousness is only on the human level like the perfection of the scribes and the Pharisees but even that is a foundation into which the Christ can manifest and reveal something far higher than physical health far greater than physical wealth it will reveal the fatherhood of God the brotherhood of man and his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven first must come that love thy neighbor as thyself period and that is the age which is being ushered in now that is the age in which we will rely not on men but on God functioning as the consciousness of mankind well it seems to me that we have reached the end of an evening thank you thank you